The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Writers and philosophers over the years have ruminated on the meaning of the word love and the differences between human love and spiritual love. In particular, Greek and other languages given to more careful hair-splitting draw differences between erotic and spiritual. In the Greek, it's eros versus agape, physical versus spiritual love. But, of course, then you run into writings like the Song of Solomon in the Bible, writings that draw together the word love into the powerful, unifying, and all-encompassing force that it is. Today's guests, Scarlett Heinbuch and David Schwartz, have seen all differences in love's definition merge in a shared death experience that brought the two of them together in human love. Scarlett holds a Ph.D. in public policy from Virginia Commonwealth University and a master's degree in public health from VCU's School of Medicine. She's a certified Reiki master in the USUI system of natural healing. She has studied complementary, alternative, and integrative medicine for more than 25 years and is an energy practitioner, intuitive consultant in the Richmond area. She's the author of Waking Up to Love, Our Shared Near-Death Encounter Brought Miracles, Recovery, and Second Chances. And her husband, David Schwartz, is a financial services professional at a large U.S. brokerage firm. A devoted husband and father, he is grateful for every day he's given. He is passionate about sharing his near-death experience of finding true love and redemption in the most unexpected of places. So, Scarlett and David, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's good to have you both on. This is unusual that we have two people at a time, so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad. But, I mean, it's, it's certainly appropriate to, to your story. Um, I wonder, um, in your book, um, Scarlett, you, you talk about having had some gifts as a child and, um, hearing the voices of, uh, deceased people. And, uh, once you actually had an out of body experience and appeared to your, to your uh, grandparents when you were actually asleep, maybe you could tell us a little about that to start. Okay. Um, well, um, that's true, Lee. Um, when I was a child, I seemed to have a lot of experiences with seeing people who had passed on um, and some I didn't even know. Um, and I was very little when these things began, I think probably about three or four years old. I had a feeling we used to stay a lot at my grandparents' house. Um, in my book, I talk about having a very turbulent childhood and there was alcoholism in my home and we would often spend quite a bit of time at my grandparents. Um, And I remember sleeping there and having a sense of floating down the stairs and, and just, you know, it was a magical time in many ways and also a scary time. But the one incident Mm -hmm. you're referring to, um, my grandfather had put me down for a nap and my cousin was also at the house and they were having lunch And they saw me appear in the kitchen, and my grandfather said, hey, you're supposed to be napping, and he clapped his hands, and I disappeared right in front of them. And they were both Hmm. startled that they ran upstairs and saw that I was sleeping on the bed, and there was no way that I could have run up there ahead of them. I was clearly sound asleep. I didn't hear about that story until, um, I guess, about 10 years ago at a family event. But those things happened quite often. And, and, and also, I just had an ability to know things. I've had a very highly developed sense of intuition. And for a child to know things without context was really unsettling. I didn't really understand divorce so much, but I would see people and see that they weren't going to be together much longer. And, and I just knew these sorts of things. And I knew sometimes when people would die, and I knew, I just knew. <laughs> there's, there's, and- it's a, Go ahead. And it sounded like it was a scary uh, experience for you. You know, your your sleeping patterns were certainly altered by being afraid of voices in the night. Right, right. There were sometimes I'd see faces even with my eyes closed. 
and not wow. knowing how to make them go away, and they scared me. And some of them were frightening looking. Sure. And, and sometimes I'd hear voices muttering, and I didn't know what it was. Interestingly, I always wanted to go to church. I wanted to, my grandparents were very devoted to their church, so it was peaceful for me to always go there. And I always felt that call to spirituality and and wanting to be in that safe space, even as a very very little child. And so I never understood what all this this was and why it was so scary and why me why was I having these sorts of experiences? And at the time, you know, in the book I date myself, so we're talking early to mid-60s, 1960s, and there wasn't a whole lot of information available, particularly to my parents or grandparents, although my grandmother was interested in these things. So, yes. but, but there wasn't any real context for me, so I was scared a lot of the time and seeking <laughs> solace where and I could. David, um, let's jump ahead to when you got so sick. What? Uh, tell us about uh, what put you in the hospital. Sure. Uh well, I had uh, I, I was living on the living in the out west uh, uh, in Washington State and had received a job offer to work in the east in Richmond, Virginia, and so was was working on a contract basis uh, for a large uh, large brokerage house that was uh, centered in Richmond, Virginia, and um, my family uh, at the time was was living in in Spokane, Washington, and so during one of the trips back to see them over a weekend. I took five airplanes over the course of 72 hours, and when I got back to Richmond to uh, on late Sunday night to uh, to get ready for my work week, um, my uh, left ear never popped from the uh, from the altitude. And uh, originally thinking that was just all it was, I let it go for a while, and finally when it when it kept continuing to be a problem, I eventually went to go see an ENT, and over the course of the next uh, six months or so. Um, my physical condition and my mental condition, honestly, deteriorated more and more to the point where I could barely function on a day-to-day basis uh, in any capacity and ultimately checked myself into uh, St. Mary's Hospital in Richmond on uh, September 5th of 2005. Mm. And uh, things were, according to the book, uh, pretty grim. Your mother came out because uh, they weren't expecting you to survive. Yeah, so again, it, it had advanced very quickly, and, and it wasn't uh, the, the illness that I had, a type of vasculitis, then known as Wegener's granulomatosis, uh, was still undiagnosed uh, for the first week or so I was in the hospital. And after I had checked myself in for what I thought was a panic attack, uh, it was only a day later that I had um, fallen into a coma. And so they, uh, the, the doctors and the, and the, the consulting uh, physicians were all trying to uh, come up with a diagnosis for me very quickly because I was uh, uh, the vasculitis it was starting to affect all of my organs and in short order I became I went from you know having having a few problems to uh, having to be on a life support basically a ventilator and mm-hmm. um, even once they once they did finally diagnose me after about a week uh, I was so far gone that uh, that the treatment was only mildly effective. Scarlett, you didn't really. Uh meet David until he was already in a coma, as I understand it from the book. That's correct. Yes. I had met T- his tell, mother, but tell I... Tell the audience how you happened to be, uh, how you happened to come to the hospital. Okay. Um, well, in the book, I'm very open about the fact that um, as a single mom at the time, I had, um, in, in, previously to this experience, I had struggled with what I was concerned about my drinking, and I had gone to some Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And I had stopped going, um, I had stopped drinking, and I was busy in school as a Ph.D. student and a single mom and just really working hard. In any case, a friend of mine uh, said, hey, you know, why don't you come to a meeting? And it had been quite a while since I had been to that meeting. So I said, okay, I went, and that's where I met David's mother, who had flown in from California that day for the third time. And She said that she had been called because they said, if you want to come say goodbye to your son, because it was clear he wasn't going to make it. Well, um, the meeting that I went to was the one that David had attended, and I had never met him because I'd stopped going. Uh, And something about his mother really touched my heart as a parent. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, you know, losing your child at any age is devastating. And I had struggled. Both of my boys had disabilities. My oldest son has 
um, had severe ADHD and, and learning disabilities, and my youngest boy at that time had epilepsy. And um, so I knew what it was like to struggle um, with, with, with life and kids and, and different types of grief. But when um, I met his mother, I was just struck by her stoicism. And also people who knew David were standing around crying because not only David mentioned being on life support, meaning the ventilator, but his kidneys had also uh, completely failed, and his mm. lungs had failed, and he had, um, in addition to the breathing, uh, the ventilator, he had a chest tube in. He'd also had blood clots, and his heart was out of rhythm, and he wasn't. Um, he also had sepsis. It was so so severe that it, it just he couldn't survive. At, at least that's what his mother had been told, and she had uh, signed the funeral papers at the hospital. That day, when she'd gotten there, flown in that evening, and was telling everybody what had happened and that he had taken that turn for the worst and wasn't going to pull through. At this time, he'd been in the coma for about three and a half, going on four weeks, um, and they wow. didn't expect him to pull through. So I met her that night, and she touched my heart, and I went up to her to say, hey, I'm really sorry. Instead, what came out of my mouth was, I don't think you should give up hope yet. And I still, to this day... <laughs> I, I, my mind was going, what did you just say? And she's looking at me like I had three heads, like, didn't you hear what I just said? And I, I told her, I said, listen, I, I can't promise anything. And I told her about Reiki that I do. And she's being from San Francisco, was very familiar with a lot of alternative um, energy modalities. And so she said, well, he's Jewish. And I said, well, I understand uh, this is not about, you know, any kind of religious peace. It's, it's just purely energy and spiritual love. And I said, that's it. And I said, I can't promise anything, but if you would like me to go see him and hold his hand, and if he is going to cross over, um, I'm fine with being there and just praying with him um, to go into the light of, and, and love. And so she said, well, you know, you, I'll, I'll put you on the list to see him. And, with, and she didn't say, assuming he's still alive, because that was pretty well understood. So I was teaching a marriage and family relationships class at at VCU at that time during the day. So I told her, you know, I would go see him again, assuming he's still alive. And uh, and that's kind of how I met David. And the next day, he was still alive, and I showed up at the hospital, and they let me back in. And that's how I met David for the very Mm -hmm. time, or saw him. We didn't actually meet because he wasn't awake. Right. Well, I guess... We've reached the point where you can tell our audience how you do finally meet. Okay. When I understood that David was so unresponsive, when I walked in, I couldn't even recognize a a person because he was very bloated. I didn't realize that people with acute kidney failure are bloated like that. And he had um, a feeding tube um, in his nose. He had the ventilator in in his mouth, and he had just tons of IV bags and um, and a central line in his neck and catheters, all kinds of equipment. And the only thing making noise were the beeps of the machines and the, the ventilator breathing. Even still, my mother had been a uh, retired nurse, and she told me even people in comas can hear what you say, so please be careful what you say and, and talk to them like they're awake. So I went up mm-hmm. and introduced myself to David and asked his permission to work with him. And even if he couldn't speak or respond, I told him that I could intuit what he wanted to do. And I, and I told him, you know, I just talked to him, Lee. I said, well, you know, what do you, what do you want to do here? If you choose to stay in this life, um, you know, you may have some unfinished business. And I told him I was there because I had met his mother and his friends and these people who really seemed to love him. And if, and if he wanted to go on, if he was done with this life, than to go in peace and, and just go into that light and that love. So I told, I told him that I was there to do Reiki if he would like me to. And as I stood there and waited, I felt a little push of air. And the room, there wasn't any reason why I would, but I took that as permission. And I took his hand very gently so, so as not to dislodge anything. And I just all of a sudden felt the sense of, of sorrow and and shame and pain, and I thought, oh, I felt his suffering, and it just opened my heart, and that's when I realized that he had been just really hurting emotionally and on every level, and 
that's and I said to him again, I said, you know, it seems to me you might have some unfinished business, and if you decide that you want to stick around, let let me see if I can help. So I went through and did um, the Reiki treatment, which is basically just working in the body's energy field um, in in the energy and some light touch because it's very hard to navigate in an ICU unit with all the equipment. And at the very end, as I was getting ready to leave, uh, he had not responded, and I took his hand to say a, a closing prayer because and it's important to note that for me, Lee, that I always pray. Um, I am Christian. David is Jewish. However, I'm respectful of anybody's faith or, or lack of faith. It doesn't matter. I, I'm grounded in my own. And I just prayed for his highest and best, and I prayed that, you know, whatever was best, it, he and God, it was between them whether he was going to stick around or not. Um, so anyway, I told him, I didn't even know I was saying this, but if he wanted me to come back and he decided to stick around, I would. And as I was leaving, I was getting ready to take my hand away from his, and I realized it was almost like um, fused to his hand. It wasn't that he was gripping my hand because he didn't have any grip, but his energy, his spiritual energy was reaching through to me. So I stood there for a moment, and I remember I kind of laughed and I, in surprise, and I said, oh, okay, so you want me to stick around? So I did, and I told him if he decided to kind of stick around tomorrow, I'd be back. So I came back, and I continued to work with him, and about the fifth day, I was holding his hand to start the healing process, and as I did, I was all of a sudden I was out of my body. He is still not recovered. He's still not awakened, but his body was showing signs of improvement in terms of, you know, not to be gross, but his kidneys were starting to work again, and he was um, beginning to show produce some urine. So, as mm-hmm. I, that was a really encouraging sign from the nursing staff. Um, so, when I was holding his hand, and the next thing I knew, I was not at his bedside. I was in the world of pinpoint light dots. I can't even describe it. I call it liquid love because even though it's not wet, it, it's a permeating force field of light and love, and it's you breathe. It's like I was being breathed by it. Words are hard to describe it, but I just was in a world of love, a love that you cannot even comprehend. It's not like you said; it's in every kind of love. It's every kind of love that you can imagine, mm. and and I was aware that I was still holding David's hand, and there was David with me there in that world of love. And he was he was there with me, and we were holding hands, and I recognized him. And that's when my spirit knew him. Even though we hadn't met in this lifetime, I knew who he was. I just, my soul knew him. I knew him, and I knew that I'd always known him, and I'd always loved him. And that's all I, I knew, and I could feel his feelings and his emotions and his um it was all an instant knowing and i also knew why i was there i understood everything that had happened to me that i had thought was so awful and difficult and challenging it was like oh okay that makes perfect sense yes of course it's it was right that all of this happened because this was all part of my life plan and i knew knew it with a solid knowing did you see any other beings around you I was not aware of any beings except all these points of light, and they felt like energy of love. So they Mm -hmm. weren't like beings, but just love energy. And did you feel, even though you were still holding hands, that you'd gone to a a totally different space? Oh, yes. I was in a completely different space. I don't even know what dimension you can possibly call it, except that um, it was just, just being surrounded by these, dots of love we were in the the white light it was white light but it was dots of light so tiny and so full and thick it was almost solid but not quite and you know it's very hard for me to describe how it was but it was just being surrounded and embraced in a cocoon of love that is unlike any earthly kind of love were you and david communicating at that point in our minds and he was telling i knew that he knew me too it's like we were just thrilled to be together and know each other in this realm. It's like, oh, well, we've always known each other. Oh, okay, we've always known each other. (laughs) David, do you recall the same thing? 
I had a much different experience at the same time. And, and looking back on it, when I was first, when I first was awakened, um, people asked me what I remembered while I was while I was in the coma. And I would always say, just I felt peace and love. And I didn't understand why I was saying that. Of course, this was after I had already um, awakened, and upon first awakening, saw Scarlet. And while I don't have any uh, recurring conscious knowledge of what happened when I when we were in that shared space, I do know that when I came back, there was a person who I'd never seen before in the in the you know in the physical world, who I looked at and knew everything about her, uh, knew that I was in love with her, knew that I would marry her. And um, that was a pretty dis- disconcerting realization to come to uh, when you combine it with all the other prosaic uh, things that, that happen in a hospital when uh, when someone is uh, you know brought back and, and from a coma. So yes, uh, that that was that was the major uh, impact for me was to see Scarlett there and and I refer to her as my you know my angel floating around my hospital room uh, <laughs> and and come to understand that although we had never met here before that we were sort of, you know, somehow that we got put together and we're going to be together. What are your thoughts about the idea of reincarnation? Do you think you knew each other from a past life or lives? I think it's certainly possible. I do believe that there's something there. I've seen, I will say, you know, Scarlett is, has been a researcher of these sorts of phenomenons and others. Uh, for many years, and uh, this was all new to me when I met here, so only, it's only been the past 12 years that I've been really uh, scratching the surface of uh, things like life between lives and reincarnation possibilities. But from some of the things that I've read and that I understand, it absolutely um, it is a very, very good possibility that we may have known ourselves, uh, may have known each other uh, at some other point. And Scarlett, what do you think about reincarnation? Well, my understanding of it, Lee, is that our consciousness never dies. And so I do believe that our consciousness can inhabit um, other bodies. My understanding of time is certainly a little different because in our world we look as linear and progressive. Um, and being in that space, it's a timeless nest. So I believe that there's all sorts of ways to learn lessons and to grow into our spiritual evolution. So in the sense that um, I understand reincarnation, it makes perfect sense to me that we do um, come back. We do have lessons. Love never dies. I know that from these experiences and also prior to David, having had other experiences with people who had passed on um, and just feeling that their energy might have moved into another body at some point. You know, there's there's lots of research going on in this realm that's been conducted at major universities, such as UVA's uh, Division of Perceptual Studies with um, the Dr. Ian Stevenson's research from years and years ago about reincarnation. It's very well documented in other countries and in and, and his work here that... You know, there's there's evidence based for it. Um, so yes, I believe in reincarnation, and and I also believe in the timelessness of love and the fact that it just never dies. And that's that's what David was showing me that there's this amazing love, and we are all connected. And that's what those dots felt to me as well. That 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 love, we are on a fabric of love in this world that if we would just open our eyes, just wake up a little bit to just being in a loving space with one another. But David was meant, I was lonely at the time, and he was too, and we were meant to be together. Um, So, yes, I believe in reincarnation and destiny and fate and and purpose. And And my spirit knew at that time that I was supposed to be with him exactly in this moment, in this time. And, you know, that was... 12, almost 13 years ago. So, so yes. People often speak of the healing power of love, and mm-hmm. certainly uh, the love that you you guys experienced, uh, it seems to me, must have had a hand in David's getting well again. Absolutely. Um, the love, the healing energy was 
amazing. It was transformative. And we also had healing helpers from other dimensions. It took me 12 years to write the book, Lee, and I was uncomfortable putting even that part in. But um, we did have, in our in my prayers for all that was sacred and holy in, in God's holy world and dimensions that, you know, we can't even fathom, um, there was a time David's kidneys were destroyed from the uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, and, and that's what it is. It's it's not only multi-system organ failure, it's multi-system organ um, destruction. And mm. even if he, we were told that even if he did live, um, the, his kidneys were completely destroyed. So to have this, you know, happen, now we would focus on that, and I did speak to all of his organs, you know, speaking out loud, affirmative prayer. Um, but there was an experience we had where um, I clairvoyantly, if you will, saw my mind's eye, these blue beings um, that were humanoid-like, but I saw them replacing his kidneys um, with with healthy ones. And I, I saw them in my mind's eye doing this. And I was at home, and the next day when I went in to, to see David, he had made a, a marked recovery. And his kidneys seemed to be doing really, really well. They needed some calibration, so I used some oils and tuning forks as well in my work with him um, and aromatherapy as well. But it was just, it, it was really stunning how we were getting help all over. And David's kidneys today and even upon his release are completely healthy and there is no explanation why. Um, no. Most people who have what he had, um, Wagner's granulomatosis, either do not survive it, or if they do, they're they're very disabled and on a transplant list um, or on dialysis permanently, um, and usually, like I said, permanently disabled because it's a debilitate, the very debilitating um, disease, and it's chronic, so yeah. um, it's often treated like cancer, and and uh, you know David's been in remission now all these years with no medication um, and he's he's healed so we have to say something transformative did happen way beyond D David do you were you aware of this um, new energy in your body I mean did you feel like something uh, uh, supernatural was going on within you not not as such I, I knew that, that when when I started to uh, regain my cognitive senses, which, which took a, a few days after I had awoken, um, I, I did ask the nurses and some of the doctors uh, just how sick I was. And they, as they explained to me what had happened, uh, it became clear that there were these uh, unexplained uh, healings that had happened specifically in, with the kidney, because uh, as my nephrologist kidney doctor had told me, um, he would come in every day and he would tell me how much more uh, percentage uh, function that my kidney had, had gained over the night. And mm -hmm. um, that just doesn't happen. Uh, so while I may not have understood it at a, at a you know, a, a, some sort of spiritual supernatural level, I certainly knew that what was happening to my body was not uh, the usual course that these things take. Um, but it wasn't until much later that I realized just how, catastrophic my situation really was yeah well listen uh scarlet and david i'm unfortunately we're out of time um tell the listeners how they can get a uh, find how they can find your book waking up to love okay thank you lee um well the book waking up to love our shared near death encounter brought miracles recovery and second chances is available on amazon barnes and noble and pretty much any um bookstore it can be ordered from and it's available on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, as well as paperback. And it is available worldwide. So Terrific. Um, yeah. Well, my thanks to Scarlett Heinbuch and David Schwartz for sharing their amazing story with us today. Um, if you'd like to listen to this program again, just go to our website at NDE Radio. And for more information about IONS and their upcoming Labor Day weekend annual conference in Seattle, Go to their website at IANDS.org. Be with us again next week, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. <laughs>